This morning's first scripture reading is from the New Testament, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses 10 through 20, verses that are, I'm sure, familiar to many of you. Paul writes to the church, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, (coughs) and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will be fearlessly so that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should may he add his blessing to the reading of his word This morning's second scripture reading is in the Old Testament from the book of the prophet Isaiah from the 54th chapter, reading verses 11 through 17, and that can be found on page 718 in the Red Church Bible. Again, the 54th chapter of Isaiah, verses 11 through 17. Afflicted city, lashed by storms and not comforted, I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with lapis lazuli. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. In righteousness, you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. See, it is I who created the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord And this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you 
would make this passage relevant to our hearts today. Give us understanding, uh, be our teacher. Uh, may uh, w w what I share uh, this morning, may it be the words of God uh, to the hearts of your people. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, uh, yesterday when I was uh, ready to do the committal, I, I said to the Corliss family and those who were there to support, look, uh, I'm getting hammered with allergies. I don't have the virus, okay? Um, and if for some reason, you know, uh, well, if I have to shout because I start to lose my voice, then I'll shout nothing personal, okay? Um, but hopefully we'll, we'll get through this, all right? I felt great walking in here this morning, and it just kind of goes south. I don't know. So uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about uh, being afflicted and yet triumphant, and that's a paradox. It kind of is a strange thing, um, uh, but it's true in reality. Uh, it's an oxymoron, you know, jumbo shrimp. How can the two be the same, afflicted and yet triumphant? Uh, I was thinking, uh, with God, all things are possible, right? Uh, that's, that's who we are as the people of God, and I want to talk about that today. Um, uh, before we uh, get into the, the text here, I want to, well, we're going to get into the text. I want to lay some contextual building blocks because what really grates my spirit is when people take a passage of Scripture and they twist it and they take it out of context, or they apply it in such a way where it's irrelevant, or they interpret it in such a way where you might as well be living on Pluto, okay? Uh, context is, a sen is essential to rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to put things in context. I think of what Solomon says in the proverb, uh, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word fitly spoken. You have to put scripture in its context. Um, now, if you take a look at the book of Isaiah, and you may not know a whole lot about Isaiah, but Isaiah has like 66 chapters. There's a whole lot to know. Uh, it's broken down generally into two parts. Chapters 1 through 39 is judgment. Chapters 40 through 66 is comfort. But a major theme that runs through all of Isaiah is that God is coming to establish His kingdom in righteousness. And we see that that is ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where Scripture is going. Now, chapter 54 significantly falls in the shadow of Isaiah 53. If you know anything about Isaiah 53, it is a suffering servant chapter. Now, there are several passages that are chapters that are kind of put into the suffering servant category, but... Chapter 53 is the pinnacle of it. And it speaks of the cross of Christ and His rejection, His redemption, uh, His being crushed for the sins of the people. And so this is why chapter 54 is so significant because God says someday that Israel, the Jewish people, will be comforted. As a nation, she has a future and a hope. Now, Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. As you may know of Old Testament history, the tribes were split, ten northern tribes, two southern tribes. The northern tribes were carried off by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Isaiah's ministry runs from about uh, 740 to about 680 BC. And so, uh, probably at this time when Isaiah wrote, the ten northern tribes are already gone. And so he's talking especially to the tribes that are left. And, and so, God foresees a day when Israel will come back to the land and be blessed as a nation. That's significant. If you've been scattered, you've been carried away, you've been down and out, God promises that He's going to gather and bring, and bring the people of God back. So, Isaiah 54 is about the future of the nation Israel in the promised land. And God will fulfill His 
promised to the Jewish people. Now, let me go through here very quickly and highlight some of these blessings that are going to come to the nation. And then I want to give you a sense of what some people do with it that should not be done and what we're going to do with it today. Okay? So the, the nation in verse 1 is presented as coming out of captivity. I just talked about how the ten northern tribes are scattered. The southern tribes are going to be carried away. Jerusalem, verses 2 and 3, will be a vibrant city again after the captivity. Enlarged. Uh, verse 4, her shame will be banished. Verses 4 through 7, she'll be reunited with the covenant-keeping God. Uh, verse 10, his covenant of peace will be unshakable. Oh, that is so precious. Verses 11 and 12, uh, despite her affliction, she's going to be foundationally established. She will be restored and comforted, verse 14. God's favor and protection will be upon her, verses 16 and 17. This is the future inheritance of the capital city. Now, some of these truths have been realized in the sense that Israel is back into the land. Um, but if you go through here, this is not full restoration. Uh, the Gentile, Gentile, Gentile nations have controlled the holy city and the Jewish people for thousands of years. And they will continue to do so until God comes in the heavens and protects Israel, his people. Uh, we're studying that now in, in Revelation. Now, you should be aware what some people do with this. Some people see Isaiah 54 as a chapter that does not apply to the future nation of Israel. Some, some see this as being fulfilled in the captivity. When they came back after being, you know, taken away, you know, Israel was blessed. Uh, that's, that's in part. That's not fulfilled. That's not in full. And then there are those who take these verses and they only apply it to the church. And there's this great confusion between interpreting Israel as the church and the church as Israel. That is very, very poor interpretation. Israel is a, is a nation in the Old Testament. The church is something new that God had established uh, in times past. And we'll talk about that in a second. But you, you have to have proper interpretation. Distinction between Israel and the church. And then there's, there are those who would simply exclude the church altogether from this passage of Scripture. And that should not be either. Because I would submit to you that this is a beautiful picture of what God has done for the church, spiritually speaking. Physically, this applies to Israel. Spiritually, it applies to the church in so many ways because Israel and the church are in the same spiritual brotherhood in the sense of what God does with both of them at some point. And so when it comes to interpretation is one thing, application is quite another. And so the church most definitely partakes in the spiritual blessings of the nation. And I think this is why some people confuse Israel and the church and the church in Israel. Uh, Gentiles are brought into fellowship uh, as fellow heirs, Ephesians 2, Romans 11. This is what we call the church, Jew and Gentile under one roof. Read Ephesians 2 sometime. The Apostle Paul never saw it. The Jews never saw it. It's a revelation of God from times past. So when it comes to interpretation, the church is not in this passage. When it comes to application, the church receives the spiritual blessings of Israel. These, this, these verses are about the millennial reign of Christ coming to save the nation, restore the nation. And yet these, these, these uh, truths here are spiritually applied to the church in all the full sense of the, of, of the word. Because we're of the faith, same faith community. Jesus said to the Jews, Abraham longed to see his day. You know, pe Jewish people and Gentile people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are of the same faith community. And so, 
In many respects, Israel was afflicted and yet triumphant. The church is afflicted and yet triumphant. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 9 through 13, the Apostle Paul talks about how the church was a revelation that, um, that, that God had manifested to him. Uh, he says, it was planned in eternity. He says, verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church, Jew and Gentile under one roof, is the instrument of, that God has ordained for the preaching of the gospel today and, the, and for the dissemination of his word. The church is the encampment of the glory of God. We looked at this the other, uh, a couple months ago when we studied the Ephesians chapter 3. Just like the glory of God hovered upon, it came down and was in the, the, the camp of the Israelites, the glory of God hovers upon the church of God. The church is the foundation and the pillar of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, the church is the temple of the living God. The church is the body of Christ, the community of saints. The church partakes in the glory of the new covenant, which was ultimately intended for Israel. Jeremiah 31. And so I submit to you this morning that Israel and the church have the same spiritual dynamics that we experience Uh, For example, God's heart was set on Israel in eternity past. But that is also true of the church. The church has been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Israel, the nation, was to bring those blessings to the world. The church is none other than co-heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans 8. We live and reign with Him. And yet... Romans 9, is not Israel the heir of the Old Testament covenants? In Genesis 15, God promised the Jewish people land. 2 Samuel 7, God promised David, a king that would sit on the throne of uh, the Davidic throne and reign from Jerusalem forever. Jeremiah 31, the new covenant as promised that was, that was Jeremiah speaking of the new covenant for the Jewish people. And there's a day coming where Isaiah says that the Lord will teach all of the nation. Oh, that's so precious. And so I would say to you that the church in Israel not only have the blessings in common triumphantly, but we have the sin in common as well. Now, uh, The church struggles with sin as Israel does. The church spiritually falls away. You know, we may come in here some days and worship, but sometimes our heart is far from Him, right? We both have a spiritual waywardness. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Israel. That's the church. That's the world. Both carry the sin of shame as sinners. Now I speak practically because spiritually our sin is under the cross. But practically, you know, some people just carry the weight of sin. And, and, and look, we remember our shortcomings, right? While it should be left at the feet of the cross, we do carry our shame of sin. Uh, We're sinful and yet saved by God's grace through faith. We've been reunited with God because we were alienated as as sinners. And and, and God alienated His people when they sinned, the nation. And God will reunite them again someday. We've experienced His comfort, so has Israel. And she will again someday too. We've been spiritually restored. Spiritual restoration is the promise to the nation in these, in these verses. We've been shown the favor and the grace and the mercy of God. So has Israel. We have the promise of divine protection. And that's the promise for Israel too. Everything that could be said of the nation, the chosen people, the same could be said of the church. 
the people of God who have been chosen in this age. It's true. And that's why these scriptures apply. Uh, consider, consider the human condition of the heart. You go back into the Old Testament, don't you see the ugliness of sin and choices and decisions that were made? And by great, great people, great saints. And we see the ugliness of sin in the life of the nation. And we see the ugliness of sin in the human condition in the church. The church is splitting and splitting and splitting and there's all sorts of factions and people don't get along. It's there. Uh, you, you read about the sin on the pages of the New Testament. Read the book of Acts. Barnabas and, Barnabas and Paul. They had an argument. <clears throat> an argument. <laughs> I'm losing my voice. And yet God used it. And I'm not suggesting that you have an argument with a brother or sister in Christ so God would use it. But I'm saying it, the ugliness of sin is there. And despite all of this, both have an inheritance. It's a spiritual inheritance. A chosen race, a holy people, a people of God's own possession. The apple of His eye. And if you... If you a big part of this inheritance is... Israel has a, had a spiritual journey in the midst of the wasteland. Isn't that our walk? We're on a spiritual journey in the midst of the wasteland. We're afflicted as the people of God because we're in the world but not of it. We're established spiritually by the grace of God in Christ. Established in righteousness, spiritually protected. Israel too. But she, she experienced divine wrath. Except for the grace of God. There go I. We have the promise in verse 17 that no weapon against the people of God shall prosper. Israel's lot is being afflicted, is, 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 is one of affliction and yet being triumphant. And that's the church's lot. Affliction, afflicted and yet triumphant. And I would say to you, I would say to you, that as you look at your life, I think you know what affliction is. As the church, you know what affliction is. You've lived it. You've identified with Christ and you get mocked, you get scorned, you get made fun of. As the church, you're hated, you're persecuted, you're oppressed as the people of God. That was true of Israel. That's true of the church. Try to speak out for Jesus today. What, what happens? You're afflicted. You know what it means to be poor and weak and sick and helpless. That's what the word afflicted is, means in the Hebrew here. That was Israel. A people that didn't have a place. That was wandered and God gave them a place. You and I, we had no place, no... We weren't even heirs, and yet God brings us into that blessed, blessed assurance. Makes us heirs. Sick, spiritually, helpless, in many, many different ways. Weak, poor. Sometimes you could almost, you know, say, that, that's my life. And yet, in our weakness, He's made strong. In our weakness, God shines through and gets the glory. Amen? In this affliction, and we don't typically think about it this way, because we're the church, right? Jesus said that the gates of hell will try to prevail against the church. That's affliction. That's oppression. That's being helpless and, and weak. And in it appears that Satan's winning. And good luck with that one because God says he's going to build his church. God is building his church. As I speak, people are getting saved. People are coming back to God. God wins, Satan loses. And yet, haven't you felt afflicted? I have. The oppression is real. The opposition is real. Invite somebody to church. 
How many times have you invited somebody to church and you feel like a failure because nobody ever shows up? You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, what would be a great picture of the church um, afflicted and triumphant? I, th I think Lot, Abraham's nephew, is a great picture of the church. His life's a metaphor, if you will, for that. Uh, if you go over to the New Testament, what did Jesus say about Lot? Righteous Lot. Now, when I think of Lot, I don't always think of the word righteous. But Lot was righteous. But you know the story about Lot, right? Because he was, he was given a choice, and he picked the wrong Lot. <laughs> he picked the Lot, the parking lot, if you will, down in Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was a huge problem for him. Not a good choice. And Jesus said that Lot suffered daily. Daily he suffered. He was afflicted because of the ungodliness that was around him. I take a look at what's happening in our society today. Oh my, you talk about afflicted. You go crazy over it after a while, right Harold? You go crazy with it. Godlessness all over the place. Righteous Lot. And he didn't leave a great legacy either. I mean, you know, the rest of the story, he wound up in a cave with his daughters and they wanted children and there was kind of that relationship there. And, um, but he was a saved man. Righteous Lot. And I think it's a great, great picture of the church. You know, wallowing in sin, wallowing in the, so in the Sodom and Gomorrah parking lot, if you will. Uh, afflicted and triumphant and yet oppressed. Oh, that, that God would come and deliver me from this body of sin in this wicked place. It's, it's wicked, folks. It's really wicked. You know, um, I look at the church, because you're part of the church. I look at other churches, other people. Um, there's a lot of saints that are struggling. Spiritually. Emotionally. Economically. Physically, especially during this time. Many are living in the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah. Many have parked there like Lot. Sin, the flesh, the devil seems to have its upper hand. The demonic seems to be on the rise. And you know, quite frankly, don't you get tired and worn out? You get tired of fighting. You really do. It's almost like you're in the hottest part of the battle... And, you know, like David had the soldiers withdraw and, you know, Uriah was struck down. You feel like you're in the hottest part of the battle and you just can't swing the sword anymore. Uh, you know, that's the afflicted part. And yet, I look at this passage of Scripture and I say, but God promises to renew. God promises to restore. Even though the outward man perishes, the inner man is renewed daily. You know, folks, there are, there are times where it's like, you know something, I'm done. I'm done with this. I don't want to go on anymore. I'm tired. I don't want to be a pastor. Sometimes I don't even want to be a Christian. Because you fight, 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 you're just tired. You're worn out. And, you know, sometimes I don't even have a word for you folks. And then last minute, God just kind of swoops in and gives me something. All the time. God has promised a rebuilding, a, a, a rebuilding physically and a spiritual restoration for the nation Israel someday. And uh, yet, as I look at the scripture, God has promised a spiritual renewal for the church every day. Israel's rebuilding and restoration is future. Ours is now. Ours is now. We get down, but we're not out. We get discouraged, but God comforts. We take our eyes off the Lord, God reminds us to look up. We fall down, He picks us up. We get fed up, He fills us up. Now, even the Apostle Paul felt that. He says in 2 Corinthians 
chapter, um, um, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, I love those verses. Why? Because the presence of God and God's protection is with his people. That's what the text says here. God establishes in righteousness, gives you a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Take a look at verse 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Uh, whether it's physical or spiritual, that is true for Israel. That is also true for the church. That's the divine favor. That's the divine protection that God has upon his children. Now, in context here, interpretation, remember God sent the Assyrians and he sent the Babylonians. They were sent from God. But God's word says, everything after, after you've come back from the captivity, everything after that, I didn't send them. That wasn't from me. It's from the pit of hell. That's what it was. Those that seek to harm Israel are not from the hand of God. That's what the text says. These truths apply to the church too. No weapon formed against the people of God will prosper. Uh, Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 18, wants to go into a city and preach the gospel. You know, remember he got beat up and he was stoned and he was kind of thrown outside the city a few times, right? Um, I think he was a little anxious about this one. God says to him, uh, no one can lay a hand on you. I protect you. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 10. No one can touch you and me unless God physically allows it. I don't know, this isn't in my notes, Mim, but your husband, God rest his soul, told me years ago that he confronted this treasurer in the church. She was stealing money. She pulled a shotgun on him. And you know what he said to her? You cannot touch me. It's true. She put the shotgun down. Luke 10, verse 9, we have the authority in Jesus' name to overcome the power of the enemy. He delivers. God delivers. He does not harm. He seeks our welfare, not our destruction. As Paul writes in Romans, but in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. Another way to express it, we're triumphant. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul writes, But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumphant procession in Christ. Always leads us in triumph in Christ. Now, final point here. Take a look at verse 17. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the Lord. Their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Um, that word vindication literally means to make righteous. Uh, the scripture is saying that God will make his children righteous. That obviously, we're, we're interpretation, nation Israel. Application, the church. We are right and just before Almighty God. Why? Because, it's the merits, because of the merits of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is part of the spiritual inheritance of the church. Uh, the New Testament scriptures pointed to this uh, righteousness. Romans chapter 3, there's a righteousness that's revealed from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not a righteousness from the law. 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verse 30, Christ is our wisdom and our righteousness, our sanctification and our redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.21 he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Old Testament scriptures about righteousness. Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God. It was reckoned to him as righteous. 
How was that? Because God looked to the cross. He saw the shed blood at Calvary. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. The righteous like Abraham shall live by faith. God looked to the cross. Isaiah 54 verse 17. God's people are vindicated. Literally, they'll be made righteous. They'll be righteous in Him because God could then, as it applies to Israel, look back to the cross. And as it applies to the church, look back to the cross. And it's a righteousness that comes by faith. You don't have to work for it. You can't work for it. Romans chapter 4 says if you work for it, it's a debt. Do you ever stop and think about you working for God? If you're, if you're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, then it amounts to nothing. If you're doing it to earn salvation, God says it's a debt. Because everything is under sin. Everything is under judgment. Except for those who find their place in Christ, in the Beloved. And so, uh, as I close here, uh, I would submit to you that the church, in many respects, partakes of the spiritual aspect of the life of Israel in the sense of being afflicted and yet triumphant. It's, it was true of Israel, it's true of the church. And it's an oxymoron, and it's a paradox. But it's true in every sense of the word. If you are a believer, you're afflicted. And yet you're also triumphant. So that's what God has laid upon my heart this day. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you uh, for the Holy Scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. And we thank you that there is a righteousness revealed from heaven and it comes to us through the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we don't live by the law. If we live by the law, we have to be saved by the law and that is uh, a system of works. Uh, we thank you that uh, salvation is by your grace through faith. And we thank you that uh, even faith is a gift and we bless you for that. Uh, we Thank you for what you're going to do uh, for the nation Israel someday. Uh, we're blessed to be uh, partakers in this spiritual brotherhood. Uh, we're blessed, Lord, uh, to bear the name Christian. We're blessed to be able to share the gospel. Uh, we're blessed uh, to be able to be persecuted and, and afflicted for your sake and for righteousness' sake. And uh, we're blessed uh, that we're triumphant in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we take these truths with us today. Uh, may we share them boldly, uh, confidently, uh, knowing uh, that you're the one um, who um, sends forth your word. It doesn't return void. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.